I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1 in your Bible, your Bible app. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Turn, uh, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Look a lot like this. Turn to page 1177 and you will find 1 Timothy chapter 1. If, uh, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of these with you. It is our gift to you because we want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Hey, we're continuing our freeway series, and I want you to know that I hate fear. I hate fear. I I mean, I I just loathe it. I know the power that fear can hold on our lives and and how it can steal the joy and and just the life that God created us for. It it holds us captive and and takes away the freedom that we crave, and, and I know this personally. So I hate fear. I was about 13 years old. I was tubing down the Salt River with my youth group, and we came to some cliffs, and some of the, you know, cool kids decided they were going to go over there and jump off the cliffs, and I swam over there with them. This was back in the 70s when things were wild and unregulated. And, uh, and so we, uh, you know, we got up there, and they jumped, and uh, I hate to say this, but I chickened out. I chickened out. I looked. I wanted to jump, uh, but the, that voice of fear inside of me said, you can't do it. You'll get hurt. Do all this kind of stuff. So I crawled down in shame, slunk back through the water to my tube, and, uh, and continued on the trip. And, and some of you are going, well, that's the wise thing to do. You shouldn't be jumping off cliffs anyway. It's not the point of the story to debate whether you should jump off cliffs or not. Not sure you should tube down rivers because your backside freezes while your top side burns. But... Uh, <laughs> But we were kids, and, and, uh, and it was fun. And, and here's the thing. That momentary act controlled by fear set up camp in my life. And it began to haunt me, and it began to own me, and remind me that I was a yellow-bellied, chicken-livered coward. Uh, that I was a failure. I was a loser. And, and that fear spoke into my life in completely unrelated ways for the next year. And so the, a year later, we're tubing down the Salt River and, uh, with the youth group, and we came to some cliffs. It might not have been the same cliffs, but people went over there to jump off, and I swam over there to jump off, and, and, uh, and I got up there, and I was still afraid, but I was going to jump even if it killed me because I was not going to let fear own my life. By the way, I still jump off of cliffs. Uh, if, you're, if I'm with you on a boat and there's some cliffs there, I'm going to say, let's stop and I'm going to jump. Not because I need the thrill in my life anymore, but because I want to remind fear that it doesn't own my life still. I hate fear. Because freedom requires fearlessness. We're, we're talking about freeway, the, the not-so-perfect guide to freedom, and freedom requires fearlessness. It doesn't require that we never feel afraid. We're not talking about living life with the absence of feeling afraid, but it's refusing to let fear set the agenda for your life. That's what fearlessness is, refusing to let fear set the agenda for life. So today, what are you afraid of? What is keeping you from experiencing the freedom that God desires for us to live in? I mean, God's offering us freedom. What's keeping you from it? What are you afraid of? And and when I ask that question, I'm not talking about phobias, like maybe you're afraid of heights, or maybe you're afraid of water flying, or, or, you know, claustrophobic, you know, tight spaces. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. Maybe you're afraid of snakes. Uh, How many are you afraid of snakes? Yeah, okay, a lot of hands go up. Yeah, I don't really want to have close encounters with them either myself, but we're not talking about those kind of phobias. We're talking about deep-rooted fears that guide our decisions and the choices that we make for life and how we're going to live life. So today I want us to look at some of these areas that we struggle with regarding fear. Where where fear tends to speak into our lives a lot because, for the record, God does not want us living in fear. God does not want you living in fear. That's why the phrase fear not or do not be afraid is found in Scripture over 300 times. He wants us to hear it. One of my favorite verses, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. It's just a few pages farther on in your, in your Bibles. If you want to look at it, mark it. It says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, 
God did not give you a spirit of fear. When you, that voice of fear in your life is speaking, that is not from God. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. God wants us to live in power. He wants us to live in love. He wants us to live self-controlled lives, not in fear. So if you want freedom, don't be afraid to tell the truth about yourself. Don't be afraid to tell the truth about yourself. 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. Timothy is uh, two letters written by the Apostle Paul to his uh, mentee, the, his protege, Timothy. He led Timothy to the Lord when he was just a teenager and raised him up. And now he's sent him out to go be a minister in churches, to be leading churches. And, and this is what he writes to him beginning in verse 12. I thank him who has given me strength. Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Don't be afraid to tell the truth about yourself, because that's what the apostle Paul does when he's writing to Timothy. Now, he's referencing back to his conversion story, uh, his story of life change, which is found in Acts chapter 9. Uh, I'd encourage you to go home and read Acts chapter 9. It's an amazing testimony of Paul's transformed life. Uh, now, don't be confused because it's talking about a guy named Saul. Saul and Paul in the New Testament are the same guy. Saul is his Aramaic name. So when he's dealing with Hebrew people, he's called Saul. When he's dealing with Gentiles, Greek speakers, he's called Paul. Uh, That's why we call him the Apostle Paul, because he was the Apostle to the Gentiles. But he didn't start that way. He started off as this religious zealot. He was was passionate for his Jewish faith. And, And he was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader, and he was a teacher, and he hated Christians. He hated the whole idea of Christianity, in fact, because he felt like it was a perversion of Judaism. And so he took this task to eradicate Christianity from Jerusalem. So he was there overseeing the very first martyr of the Christian church, a guy named Stephen, who was one of the first deacons, helped stone him to death. And then Paul went on this ravage this persecution of the Christians in Jerusalem and he had them executed and he had them imprisoned and he ruined hundreds if not thousands of lives and then he took his hate show on the road to Damascus he decided it's not enough just to persecute Christians here I got to go to Damascus and persecute them there and on the way to Damascus Jesus interrupted his life dramatically bright light shining down from heaven a voice speaking to him Paul was blinded, and and it was there that God changed his life, and he went from being a persecutor who was driven by his hatred to being a preacher who was compelled by his love for Christ. And God sent the one who hated Christians to become the Gentiles' apostle, the preacher, to people so they could know Jesus. Now, that's a transformation. But Paul is not afraid to talk about his failures. He's not afraid to talk about his past, his rebellion, and his sin. And he knows that he is responsible for destroying the lives of of thousands of innocent people. And he calls himself the foremost sinner, the worst sinner of them all. So here's a question. Are you afraid to tell the truth about you? Are you afraid to tell the truth about you? Are you afraid people will find out who you really are, what you've really done, uh, how you've really lived, uh, how bad you really were or are? Are you afraid people will find out and, and, and judge you, condemn you, think less of you? Because my observation through the years uh, growing up in church and leading churches is that our churches are filled with people who are terrified that the people sitting around them are going to discover who they are 
They're terrified that, that people are going to find out about their weaknesses and their failures and their sin and, and, their, and their pain. And, and we try so hard to look perfect. You know, we, we come to church and we want people to think that we're better than we are. And so we want to look like we have the perfect marriage. Right? Have you ever done that? You know, had one of those just huge blow-ups on Sunday morning. Maybe in the car on the way here. So you couldn't like really turn around and go back home. And, and you get in the parking lot and, and then suddenly you just both play nice. Let's hold hands. It looks really good. We'll sit close in the chairs. You know, you're both nudging each other, but nobody sees it. Like, listen, he's talking to you. And everything's all smiles until you get back in the car going home, right? And then just pick up the fight right where you left off. But we want people to think we've got a perfect marriage. We want people to think we have a perfect family. <laughs> I'm gonna, don't, don't raise your hands. Have you ever threatened or bribed your kids on the way to church? <laughs> you better behave. Let people know that we're a happy family. <laughs> or you will pay for it when you get home. Or you just like go, hey, I'll let you play Xbox all afternoon if you're just good and act like you're happy, all right? We, we, we try to act like we, we have the perfect morals, you know, and are preaching about all this sin, and we sit there smugly like, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Can I just tell you, that was, that was part of the thing that, that just ripped my heart out when I was young. I, you know, here I was, a teenager. I loved Jesus. I wanted to live for Jesus. And, and the only time they ever talked about the things that we struggled with was when they just condemned them, and everybody nodded their head like, yep, I used to do that, but I don't anymore. And there I was, a teenage boy who loved Jesus and was battling lust in my life. <laughs> Not very well. And uh, because none of us did as a teenager. You know, and yet nobody's talking about it. And I'm dying on the inside thinking I'm the only one who's evil and has all these evil thoughts. And, and God forgive me because I'm terrible. And, you know, you grow up and you find out, hey, everybody's struggling with that. But nobody's admitting it because we all got to act like we're perfect. And people try to look like they got this perfect spirituality. Churches I grew up in, they, they demonstrate their spiritual superiority by asking questions like, oh, so how was your quiet time this morning? You know, what did God tell you? God and I were talking, we're like this, you know. And, you know, which is not really helpful when you're not a morning person. You know, it, it's like somehow unspiritual to have a conversation with God at night. Uh, and then just, you know, you guys just kind of nod in the morning, kind of like you, that's, how our, that's how our marriage works. That's kind of how it is. And, and the thing is that we try to look perfect, and so often it's a lie. And God invites us to tell the truth about ourselves. So let me just tell you, honestly, I am a scum-sucking pig center. Okay. <laughs> And I don't just say that so people go, oh, that's fine. No, it's true. I am a scum-sucking pig sinner. I do not deserve heaven. I do not deserve to, to speak for God. I do not deserve any of the blessings in my life. They are all there because of God's grace and mercy, period. So I know what I am, and the truth is I know what you guys are too, because uh, here's the way I look at it. If you're just half as evil as I am, you guys are sick, twisted people. <laughs> And it's reality, and, and I say that, and I know it's true because the Bible says that. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no one who's righteous, not even one. And we're not going to pretend here. We're going to tell the truth about ourselves, but, but that's the atmosphere we try to be as a church. But are you afraid to tell the truth about yourself? By the way, the, the Bible uh, has a word for telling the truth about yourself. It's called confession. Confession. And it says really cool things like if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. In fact, it goes on to say in that same passage, you read 1 John 1 if you want to, it says if we say that we have not sinned, then we're liars and the truth is not in us. Tell the truth about yourself. Don't be afraid to do that because confession confronts pride. See, pride pretends. Pride's trying to sell an image, trying to make us look better than we really are. And when we confess, when we tell the truth about ourselves, it kills our pride, or at least drives it away. And, and it destroys that fear of being discovered. See, our, our fear goes like this. If people find out, then they're going to judge me. 
And they're going to say things about me. They're going to accuse me. See, you were a fraud. You were fake. You were just pretending. You're a hypocrite. All this kind of stuff. And so we don't want to be discovered. But confession takes the arrows of accusation and breaks them. See, if you confess, if you admit your weaknesses, if you share your struggles and, and, and God meets you there and he, forgive, he forgives you because he promises to do that and cleanse you of unrighteousness and somebody else wants to pick up stones to hurl at you, they're just being jerks. And everybody knows it. And if the whole church is full of jerks, find a new church. Uh, and, and, and I say that because that's what I would do. You see, we want to be honest about ourselves because confession confronts our pride and, and confession defeats denial. It defeats denial. I mean, we love to deny our sinfulness, don't we? We love to pretend that we're a little bit better than we really are. And, and so what ends up happening is we know we're sinners, but we kind of defend our sin. And so we, we justify why we judge other people you know, why they're so bad and yeah, we're so not. We give ourselves some slack and we judge them. We, we like to justify uh, being mean in Jesus' name. Yeah, you ever been around people like that? Well, they deserved it. They, someone needed to tell them. Someone needed to tell them the truth. Really? Because the Bible says speak the truth in love. And by the way, last time I checked, love is patient and love is kind. So if you're trying to justify being a jerk in Jesus' name, it's not going to really work biblically. Or, or sometimes I like to just justify why my food addiction is okay, but your alcohol addiction isn't. And see, confession defeats that denial. Because it recognizes that I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, <laughs> we're all sinners, and we're all hopeless without the grace and mercy and love of Jesus. That, I mean, plain and simple, we don't have any hope without Jesus Christ. Look at verse 14 again, because Paul, in the midst of saying how bad he was, says this, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The grace of our Lord overflowed for me. The worst sinner of all, grace overflowed for him. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Sinners. Jesus came to save sinners. So if you're a good person, you're out of luck. Right? Isn't that, isn't that what it's saying? Good people are, are in trouble. Jesus actually said, I didn't come to heal the, those who are healthy. I came to heal those who are sick. You see, confession it puts us in that place where Jesus can actually save us, where he can actually heal us, where he can actually bring life to us because we're stop pre, we're, we stop pretending that we're good enough and we just acknowledge I'm a sinner and I need Jesus' love, I need his mercy because without it I'm hopeless. That's why it's so healthy for us to tell the truth about ourselves. So let's be honest about who we are. And, and by the way, don't be afraid to ask for help. Please don't be afraid to ask for help. All of us need help. That's why we need a Savior to save us. Because we can't do it ourselves. We need somebody to assist us. And, and it's not just true that we just need Jesus. We also need help from each other. So if you're struggling, if you're stuck, if you're afraid to tell the truth about yourself, then talk to someone. Uh, go to Celebrate Recovery tomorrow night, 6.30 at McCulloch Campus. You think I push Celebrate Recovery a lot? That's because I do. That's because it's healthy and it's a great place where people tell the truth about themselves. And I love that. And if you're full of it and you go there, they'll call you on it. So if you want to learn how to tell the truth about yourself, then, then go get help. Go to Celebrate Recovery or, or talk to a counselor. We've got counselors available through the church. We've got counseling uh, referrals that we'll make for you. We want to help you talk to someone. And if you're really struggling about, I can't tell anyone, then go see a counselor. Come see one of us pastors. We'll, we'd love to hear your story. We'll annoy you with grace, but we'd love to hear your story. Or, or you know what? We've got members of our prayer team. They're here after every single service. They're here at the front, and they're just waiting, gently waiting for you to come and, and share your hurts, your struggles. Uh, they want to pray with you. They want to encourage you. And you know what? They won't just pray for you for like five minutes here at the front. They will pray for you throughout the week. You see, don't be afraid to ask for help. We all need the help, and if you need it, go ahead and ask for it. Confront your fear of confession, and let us help you tell the truth, because grace and freedom is waiting for you. Secondly, don't be afraid of rejection or failure. 
Don't be afraid of rejection or failure. I'm going to invite you to turn a few pages back uh, toward the front of your Bible to page 1123, if you've got a Bible like me. Romans chapter 8 is uh, where we're going to be. Romans chapter 8, and you might want to go and read this tonight too. Uh, verses 37 through 39, the Apostle Paul says, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him, Christ, who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor heights nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul understood rejection because he was rejected by his peers. He was a Pharisee, a religious leader of Judaism, and when he converted to, to be a follower of Jesus, they tried to kill him. Paul was rejected by a lot of cities. He was literally run out of town in place after place that he traveled to and preached Jesus. He was rejected by his own country. He, he took a big offering of money back to Jerusalem to feed the poor, and the religious leaders tried to have him executed several times. When he wrote those words that we are more than conquerors, he was in prison awaiting trial that would result in his execution. And he says we're more than conquerors uh, through Jesus Christ because nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So don't live in fear of rejection. And all of us hate being rejected. So easy to say. Don't live in fear of rejection. Hard to do, isn't it? Because we hate being rejected. I know I hate being rejected even though I excel at it. Had a lot of training in it. Uh, you know, my wife, Merelda, turned me down three years in a row for the homecoming dance in high school. <laughs> but just for the record, she wasn't the only girl turning me down at that time. <laughs> I, I was familiar with rejection. I got a little bit older, and, and you know, and, and life has been good, but rejection still continues. A few years ago, I had the privilege of being elected to serve as president of the Arizona Southern Baptist Convention. And uh, that was really cool. The uncool part of it was I lost that election two times previous. The only person I know to do that. Yep. Rejection. We don't ever like it. But if you understand the truth of Romans 8, 37 through 39, you let it shine in your life and realize this amazing truth that Jesus died for you and nothing can separate you from his love. Jesus died for you and nothing can separate you from his love. Let that just resonate in your soul. God has accepted you. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then God has accepted you into his family and there is nothing. Read the list. There is nothing in all of creation that will separate you from God's love. Right now, you ought to be doing the happy dance on the inside. Because that's what it means. That means that you are God's and he loves you and he's not going to stop loving you, period. Now, rejection still hurts and it always will. But don't let the fear of it drive your life. Hold on to those words and realize God has accepted you. If anybody else rejects you, who cares? Ultimately, really. And don't live in fear of failure. Not past failures or current failures or future failures. Uh, the truth is we've all failed and we're all going to continue to fail, okay? Because that goes along with that whole sin stuff. That's why there is such a great promise in Romans 8, 28. You're already in Romans 8. Uh, page 1123, look at verse 28. It just simply says, And we know that, the, that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. If you love Jesus, all things work together for good. They aren't all good, but God shows up in the midst of that to work good. See, God promises to redeem our failures. That, that's the promise. God promises to redeem our failures. So, so understand, you can make a mess of your life, you can fail miserably, and God will still redeem your life. That, to me, that's the, like, the ultimate goal. You can't ruin God's plan of redemption. Let me say this again. You personally cannot ruin God's plan of redemption. You can delay it for yourself, you can miss it for yourself, but you can't ruin it. 
God is going to redeem our failures. So don't be afraid of failing. Fail, learn, improve, try again. Seriously. Go ahead and fail. You know, try your best, fail, learn from it, improve, try again. Because God is going to show up and he's going to keep redeeming your life. I, I tell people that one of the secrets to my life is to fail boldly and repent quickly. That, that's just what I've done. I try to learn from the mistakes and not repeat them, and, but I'm not afraid to make them because I can know that God promises to redeem my failures. Finally, don't be afraid to follow Jesus. I know that sounds a little bit crazy in a room full of people who would identify themselves as followers of Jesus Christ. Don't be afraid to follow Jesus. The truth is, most of us are afraid to do some of the things that Jesus asks us to do. I mean, we love the idea. We love Jesus. We love his teachings. We, we love the, the idea of his truth. But when it comes to applying it to our life, there's some things that we're afraid to do. Like Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And we're afraid to love our enemies because we're afraid to give up control. We're afraid that, that if we, you know, stop guarding ourselves against them and, and, and start loving them, that somehow they're going to hurt us again. And we don't want to let that happen. And, and so we don't really actually want to bless those that persecute us. We want to hurt them. And we're afraid to trust Jesus. You know, Jesus says that, that we're to forgive as we've been forgiven. Forgive in the same way that you've been forgiven, which kind of means that we're supposed to forgive what? Everyone. Yeah. And there's some of you that you love the concept, but honestly, you're still angry and you don't want to let go of that, that bitterness that's in your heart towards someone and, and they hurt you and you don't want to let go of that because you want to make sure that they pay for it. Somebody needs to hold them accountable, right? It make it sound real spiritual. It's not. You know what the Word of God says? Do not take your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God, for vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. In other words, God says, let me handle it. You forgive because forgiveness is for you. Forgiveness is to bless you. It's so you can let go of that anger and that hatred and that bitterness and, and just let me cleanse your soul so that you can have joy and life. But we're afraid. We're afraid to believe Jesus when he says, if you want to be great, be the servant of everyone. We're like, we love that idea of serving. We want to go volunteer for a few hours, but we don't want to live a life as a servant and, and because then that sounds like too much sacrifice and pain. And we want to avoid that in our lives, honestly. We want to be great, but we don't want to do it God's way. And so we're afraid to actually follow Jesus at that point of our lives. And yet true satisfaction, true purpose, true life is found in being a servant. We love Jesus, but we don't want to trust him at that point where he says, hey guys, be generous and give sacrificially. Actually, what he said was give and it will be given to you for the measure you use will be measured back to you. And we think, I don't have enough to, to give generously. I don't have enough to share generously because if I do, maybe I won't have enough for, for myself. Maybe I won't have enough for my needs. Maybe I won't have enough for my retirement. Maybe I won't have enough for the things that I want to do. And so we don't follow Jesus. We don't trust him at that point to provide for us. We don't believe him when he says, trust me, I'll take care of you. I'll give you enough. You know, we don't trust Jesus. We don't follow Jesus. We're afraid to follow him at, at that point of being living sacrifices, of really just dedicating our lives to the kingdom of God. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. The apostle Paul said, I urge you therefore, brothers, to be living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God. This is your reasonable service of worship. And we hear those words and they sound so beautiful and yet we're afraid to put them into practice. Don't be afraid to follow Jesus. You see, we want Jesus to approve our plans and to help us accomplish our dreams. Can I just tell you it's not going to happen? That's not how it works. Jesus invites me and you to follow him. Fearlessly. To follow him. 
He, he, he calls us to do significant things in this world, to love incredibly and be gracious in amazing ways, to give foolishly and delight in being a servant. And honestly, it frightens us. And the cost is terrifying and the journey can be unnerving. But we can trust Jesus. He proved it when he gave himself on the cross. He proved it when he defeated death. He proved it over and over and over again in your life when he's forgiven your sins and he's, and he's been there when you've been broken and he's healed you and he's encouraged you. You can trust Jesus with your life. You can trust Jesus with your family. You can trust Jesus with your finances. You can trust Jesus with your dreams. Because God's plan is better than your dreams. It really is. God's plan is better than your dreams. So don't be afraid to follow Jesus. Freedom requires fearlessness. I already told you I hate fear. It robs us of joy and steals our freedom. It imprisons us and holds us in captivity. I hate fear, so I choose to follow Jesus. What are you going to do? Let's pray.